And good, uh, good morning, everyone. Before we start, though, uh, maybe a, a couple things. The background of this slide is, is a picture that was taken over 600 years ago, an image of what a single cell was. And what's very interesting is we could see a single cell, but it took us 600 years to be able to measure 30 things on the surface of a, of a cell. Imagine that. Right? Just imagine. Another thing that's very interesting is when we look at this from an industrial perspective, because the, what was shared earlier today was about how you take those discoveries and how you take your needs and how you take the information that you have and, and how you roll it out for lots of other individuals to do bigger and better things and deeper biology. But 50 years ago, we had an instrument that was developed by Lynn Herzenberg, and the other individual in there is Bernie Shore. He was, he was at BD, and two or three other scientists at Los Alamos, and they, they built an instrument that was the first commercial flow cytometer that, that actually sorted a single cell. And we had it, but maybe we just didn't know what to do with it at that time. And then if we look over on the other side, the schematic of that instrument is exactly what we still use today. So from some parts of the world, things don't change fast. On the genomic side, things change really fast. But we're still in a position today that proteomics hasn't been scaled. And that's a real challenge for us. Now, a number of things happen when communities of scientists, consortiums like we have here today, and, and businesses get together, and industry get together to do something really special. And, uh, you know, when I look at, at what happened by putting immunology together, there was co-creation. And that's the expectation, I think, of everybody that's in here, too. Now, it's also very interesting in here that, that Dr. Rayeski is here, and, and uh, he gave us something very special in that early discovery time of hybridomas, and, and many of you probably don't know it, but we, we, had a, we had a special cell that allowed us to do lots of great fusions with, and it was the foundation of being able to do flow and being able to analyze a single cell in many different ways, and that went along with the commercial sorter, and it went along with a lot of other scientists that, that were focused, not in full areas of biology, but they were focused on a receptor. And we, we got CD3 from one lab and CD4 from another lab. And Bill Paul's lab at NIH just gave us a tremendous amount of that. And then there were a whole bunch of other people that, that gave us colors, some out of the ocean, some of them are small molecules, some of them in different sources. But all of those things had to happen collectively for us to be able to have a tool. And those same things got, will happen in this field here because we need new tools, right, to do things and we have to work together. Now other things have happened over time too. And, uh, and I think one of those initiatives that, that can impact everybody that's in here is that you'd have to have standards. And those standards have to be tight. And it's very rare that in most fields of biology that standards have stood this, this, you know, I would say the challenges of time. But there was a small group that was put together that, that workshop clones to make sure that the specificity of every single antibody was there and that there was no question. So in the fields of immunology, very few papers were ever and have ever been retracted because of of the specificity of an antibody. But in other fields, they're retracted all the time. Usually, it's because a company makes the antibody, not, not the scientist, right? So it's something to think about. And what's happened over time to show how that co-creation works, right? Because when industry gets together, lots of things can happen. In that middle ground there, it's all about from a BD perspective, the number of licenses that have come in to be able to build a portfolio of around you know, 2,000 antibodies. And every one of those, we worked with academics or pharma. 
And then we created about 15, actually it's about 18,000 different products. So what I'm, what I'm putting a foundation for here is not from just BD, it's, it's from all those companies that are downstairs, right, that are here with ideas and concepts and ways and approaches of taking what you have and commercializing it so that people can use it and make it better. Now, how big is that market of flow that started 50 years ago? Well, it's got an estimation of 5.5 billion by, by 2024. That number is almost exactly the same as the single cell market that's only been here for just a little while. So you can see how fast it grows with the number of people that are in here and the number of publications that are out there. It's, it's a field that needs consortiums to, to solve things big. And in order to get them bigger, it requires that interaction with industry to take all those discoveries and, and put them into a place where other people can use them too. So the things that I, I put up here on, on, on this slide are not just directed at BD. They're directed of every different kind of industrial partner that could be in here. And we ask questions about how we invest for our community. Because in, a, in the industrial side, it's not altruistic, but we maximize the wealth of the shareholders all those that put their money in there. We have to listen to every one of you for what the future is, right? To be able to invest the hundreds of millions of dollars that we have that go into R&D, we have to invest them correctly. We invest in internal development outside of what you would do just by listening, right? And probably the most important thing is how we build and seek a collaborative relationship because that's the foundation of where our dollars go and where our time go. Now, a couple of those things about acquiring technologies is to buy those little companies that was mentioned earlier today about how we, how, or how you should take your technologies and make companies out of them because big companies then purchase them and they purchase them for hundreds of millions of dollars. And then sometimes we have to define, you know, future businesses and technology strategies inside, and then we, we always close because the investments of good companies and big companies go all over the world. It's not just in the single cell, it's, it's to solve other health issues. Because for companies like I represent, there's a patient at the end of everything we do too. It's just in a different dimension. So if we go to a single cell and we take a BD perspective, well, let me show you some of the things that are going on that can connect right back in here in terms of how we will invest with Lifetime. They started with four different, three different acquisitions. One, a small company that helped bring new kinds of colors. So no longer do we have a problem with colors. It always was in flow. We had to have a, a way to look at bioinformatics in a completely different way, so we invested in that too. And then we bought a small little company that did all kinds of interesting things with molecular barcoding. And that was Steve Fodder's little company about three years ago called Cellular Research. And all those are purchased in by big companies to get them ready, get them ready to do something that all of you are here today working on. Then there was one last thing in here, I'll mention it, and that is we built something very special for this field. We, we built an instrument that could go in the dimensions of over or up to 50 parameters in flow. And if we look at the dimensionality of what that means when we look at a single cell, two to the 50th, because flow is binary, is a very, very big number. So the possible combinations of what's on a surface is just immense. Could we find all those two to the 50th combinations? The answer is no, but there's a lot of them. Now the partners that we've had over the years are something that we have to relay here to everybody because it's not in your field. And we have put millions of dollars in there with large consortiums. They're the best. They're the ones with foundation. They're the ones that have the best scientists. They're the ones that match best with the great big companies. So the first one up there was about a 15 million Canadian. And it was in a functional genomics place, about 
seven or eight years ago. Another one was the development of about 200 antibodies for NCI that had, through pure discovery, targets that they needed. So it was about $10 million of an investment to make those for them. A big one was with Gary Nolan, when Gary showed us that you could look at phosphorylation status by, by flow. And in order to make sure that happened for him, nearly $20 million was spent just building 103, 105 antibodies. So you can see the dynamics of what you have to do in an industrial situation. It costs a lot. But they're not always big. They also go to biomarker discovery and with, with Yoakum's laboratory. We spent a lot of time in, in looking at many different types of receptors that may be there. But what I can share with you is something really important. And that is, in order for these big consortiums to work, and if you're going to work closely with, with companies, we have program management. We have, we have structure. We have to meet timelines too. And we have to deliver to Wall Street. So what that looks like is the project plan that we did with Genome Canada, Genome Quebec, for which was mapped on every single thing that we needed to do by a certain time in order to fulfill that by the end of the entire program. So working and thinking differently than how you do you know, in your academic setting is, is a challenge when you work with big companies because companies have to work and invest their money in the right way too. Now, two other partners were, were also really important. Uh, again, this goes back to Joachim Schultz Laboratory and Mark Weyer's lab. And we're focused today in some single cell work and, and we're really looking at gene networks and embedding technologies in Bonn. Another one was the development of a sorter, the development of an analyzer, a small one, a large one, and then something that could, something that could catch a cell at 50 different dimensions. And that was all done within the US government. Imagine that, that you could build an instrument inside NIH. But big companies, and companies that are focused on the right thing can, can do those things. And they can do those things with, with this team too. Those are things that you need to look at when we, when, we, uh, when we think about our investments. So there's lots of questions that are asked. Whether it's industry or whether it's BD, it, whether this is the right community. And the answer is yes, it's the right community. And it's big and it's important, right? And that's where we put those dollars. And we ask all of these different things to make sure that we check them off on our list because they have to match the strategies of our business. And then they get smaller in how they impact really the industrial partner too. And what we've learned over time is the bigger ones are better because, because they succeed in different ways. The smaller ones are tougher to do because sometimes they pull away and then we're left with open investment. And we think about how big those markets are. And then we think about the other things about how single cells impacting BD right now. So I'd like to share in closing just a little, a few slides here about the exploration of the single cell work and the things that we're doing inside BD. We go through workflows because we know that's what you do. We can integrate technologies inside to get that single cell. And I wanna take you through something that was mentioned here earlier about being able to look at hundreds of antibodies on the surface of a cell in a different way because proteomics is finally being scaled. So I use an example of a T regulatory cell, right? One for which it's marked of a naive cell with CD45 and a cell that's marked as an effector cell with HLA-DR. And within that, we use antibody seq technologies, site seq technologies for which we not just put colors on them, we put oligos on them, finally we're mapping this and we're getting faster. Now within the context of that experiment, I'll share you this, because to an immunologist, they only like to look at flow. But if you look down below at the ABSEQ technologies and the scale for which we do and use an oligo, you can't tell the difference. And that's really important because our biology and the blood cells based on that. 
And we use these techniques to look at different clusterings of naive and, and effector cell populations, and let's just take it to this when we do a deeper dive. So this is 25,000 cells that are looked at with antibody seq technologies, all in one sample, still very expensive to do until we put a sorter in front of it. But when we match all that antibody seq data with something like this, then for every single single cell that we look at, we can do WTA or a targeted RNAs that can match the protein. And we can look very easily here at HLA-DR, which is our effector. Here's our protein and there's our RNA. This is CD45RA, our naive cell that expressed and then downregulates. And the stories are all there. And it's just an example of where the efforts and things that we go with our company are going today. So I close with this about where industry can connect with everybody that's here. And I look, at, I look at the title of what we're here in understanding cells to revolutionize healthcare. When I look at what BD does, it's advancing the world of health. It allows strategies to be guided you know, through discovery because one thing is clear, science is free and technology costs. So I close that to say thank you to everyone, but just remember there's industrial partners out there that can help every single one of the ideas and concepts that you have. I right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's start with Nikolaus. I have kind of a nitty-gritty question, mm -hmm. so apologies. Yeah. But the first slide you showed, you, you, you claimed that this, uh, the, this image was taken 600 years ago. It was that a doesn't really replication of 600 years ago of, of, of Hooke's first look at a cell. But that, that was not 600 years ago. 1655, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, my math is wrong. Yeah, <laughs> very wrong. <laughs> Anybody wants to comment on the 600 years? <laughs> Any more questions? I have another provocative question. You showed this management scheme. Um, which I think is, is excellent for a development project. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could work for something as exploratory as the single cell developments that we are currently attacking? Yeah, I, because I that do. would be would be of course an important issue in this, to how we should plan. Yeah, I, th I think when you look at those things, you know, scientists tend to not want to be in that realm, right? Um, it takes a different kind of person to be able to program things through takes very process-oriented individuals, and it's kind of on the other side of one where you're thinking about innovation. And, but what's really important at the end is to get, to get our things done you know, in a very orderly you know, process to, to, to be able to do one thing. If, if something's not working, you, gotta, you need to kill it fast. And process engineers keep you down those paths. And, because you only have so much money, right, to solve something. Those types of techniques honestly need to be embedded, you know, into academic medicine. And, and in some places they are. In pharmaceuticals, that's how they do it too. And because there's big dollars that are spent to be able to solve these. And I'll, I'll give an example here, as large as this initiative is here. You know, my R&D and my own division we're over $100 million a year. So that gives you an idea of how, how important it is to understand how do we spend those dollars. Decisions are made very quickly in, in companies um, just because we need to get to that next step too. But we can't wait for things and, and they just can't be in the incubator and try to get them later. And I, we know what those are. It's scary, it's scary to the academic side, but I would say the faster that it gets embedded and those investments that are made, it will make it better for everybody. That's a good question. <laughs>